Okay, okay. Jadi sebenarnya ni habis tegur saya ni yang dapat saya tolong. Kami sebut. Isaiah 40. Shall not 
for singing and praying. Good evening. Before we go to uh, praise and prayer requests, three praise and three, three prayer requests, I just want to share with you uh, something that I listened to. Well, not something. Uh, look, uh, Gospel worker, page 97.2, it says, seek con constantly to improve. Strive earnestly for close fellowship with the Redeemer. Live by faith in Christ. I like it. I like how it says, see Ellen White, when uh, Miss Ellen White says, seek constantly to improve. To improve what? To improve in earnestly earnestly for a close fellowship with the Redeemer and living by faith in Christ. You know, it's only by this that we're able to praise Him or, you know, we have something to praise for. You know, if somebody do not have a close or seek God earnestly, they don't really have nothing to say to praise God or, you know, there's no burden for it. But if you really, really seek the Lord and if you really walk closely, you know, there's going to be that fire burning that you really want to share the love of God. And, you know, I'm praying, you know, I haven't seen my younger brother, you know. I see some of them, but my younger brother, I won't mention them, I won't even look at them, okay. I haven't seen them come up yet. You know, I was wondering if, if, if there is a burning in their heart. Maybe there is, but they are shy. I don't know, but, you know, maybe one day, you know, I'm praying for them. I'm praying that one day they'll be so eager that they want to share. Amen? Anyway, anyway there, is there any uh, praise or prayer requests? Three, we, we take three praise and three prayer requests. Yes. Um, just prayer requests for college days. Okay, um, yes. That starts Definitely. tomorrow. Just that everyone would be um, hopefully on their best behavior. Right. And um, <laughs> also that the Holy Spirit would lead um, the people that are coming and as well as uh, those that are here. Um, but also pray for canvassing. Um, yeah, just... Yes, yes. And uh, one more prayer request for um, a close family friend of um, the Beretsky family. Um, they, there was a, um, some like the mother of their, I think, someone passed away. So, <laughs> yeah. Somebody you know that passed away. that but um i have a prayer request for 
Some of your friends are sick, like Eva's big sister at home, and she has a lot in her plate. And um, uh, she's really sick, um, Miss Riddle knows. And, um, and I just have a simple prayer request. Wait, <laughs> okay. I just pray that God may be with me well. I know people have decisions in life to make. And um, your sons, some, um, if you mess up, they're really like, there's nothing you can do about it. So I'm praying for God that may help me to choose the right um, things. Two people. I'm gonna take one more. Otherwise, I'll just stand here. <coughs> okay, yeah. Thank you, brother. Uh, your prayer is going to be answered. <laughs> but I want to praise the Lord for providing, um, especially working in the ministry. <coughs> the question comes to mind is like, okay, how am I going to be able to afford this and that? But even recently, which whenever you go to different places to speak, you meet different people, get their contact. And one of them actually recently felt impressed to um, help me out big time. They, they said, just write down what you need. And yeah. <laughs> wow, amen. So, and, and, and they're serious too. Wow. They're very serious. So. I'm going to take that step of faith. It's like, Lord, I don't want it to be greedy, but at the same time, I don't want to lie. <laughs> so just, I Listen praise the Lord for always providing. Wow, amen, amen. amen. Any, any, any other burning heart you want to share before I pray? All right, same person, come on. Okay, um, it just came to mind while I was sitting down. But I just praise God for... Just the, for the fact that we we can go to him, and just we don't lay actually lay our worries on him. Just tell him like everything that worries us. Like, um, I you know, no, I'm not gonna get into it. But I think I think a, a lot of us have insecurities, you know, and I think that's something that we can actually like bring to God and look at His Word and pray at the same time, and really find some peace. Um, like if you're not if you're not feeling adequate, just remember that you don't have to feel adequate. It's God already made provision for you, and um, that He's it's it's literally you don't have to be good enough to be to to have salvation, um, which I think it's very like that's a big blessing, you know. Amen. So Definitely. I just praise God for that. Amen. Let's pray. <coughs> want to kneel, you can. If you're not, it's fine. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, yes, thank you. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, and uh, that we are able to come as we are. Lord, forgive us, each one of our sin. You know, each individual of us, Lord, our thoughts, our action, cleanse us for all our unrighteousness. Lord. Give us the right spirit, renew the right spirit within us, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to praise you for your goodness as you provide for Brother Alex. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless him as he continues to serve you too, Lord. And bless other students, those who, those who are in need as well, Lord. And Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to pray for the college there, the students that come here, Lord, that you impress in their heart uh, according to your will that you know, when it's, it's for them to stay, then Lord, make it clear for them. And also, I uh, want to pray for uh, one of the people that Gabriel know, I mean, uh, Oscar know, that uh, passed away. Lord, I pray you please, Lord, bless the family, comfort them, and we give everything into your hand, Lord. Lord I also want to pray for um, 
precious sick friend. And uh, as she requested, she is wanting to do what is right. And I pray we may also second the prayer, Lord, because we ourselves cannot do what is right, but only with you, Lord, you can help us to know uh, what is right, Lord. And Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to also pray for the college upcoming canvassing trip. Lord, I pray you please you go with them. Fill them with the Holy Spirit. Prepare their ground. Pre prepare their field. And the people they're about to meet, Lord, I pray that you please send on your many angels to protect them as they go out to canvas. Not only that, that they may reach so many souls, Lord. Lord, I pray that you also provide for them. Give them holy boldness. Many divine appointments, Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. And Lord, I pray you bless Dr. Carlos as he about to share tonight. Lord, fill him with the Holy Spirit. May the word that come out of his mouth be your lead and guide. Lord, as for those of us who listen, Lord, may we get something out of it. May it not just be something that we listen to and forget, but something that we can apply in our life. Fill us with the Holy Spirit now, Lord. Fill this atmosphere with the Holy Spirit. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that prayer. Appreciate that. Um, back in 1642 to 1727, we had a scientist who was recognized as one of the most influential scientists in the scientific revolution. He was in England, um, Sir Isaac Newton, and many of us recognize his name. Uh, he's the one that discovered or uh, the the law of gravity, the existence of gravity, and, and he was able to formulate it into a law uh, where you take two masses and the force of attraction between these two masses is, can be calculated by multiplying the two masses together, dividing by the squared radius that separates them, and then multiplying that whole number by the gravitational constant. And so that was the law of gravitation that Isaac Newton um, described back in his day uh, in the 1600s. Now, he could describe gravity, but he couldn't explain it. And it was 200 years before someone came along who could explain it. And some of you already know who that was. That was Albert Einstein. Uh, explaining the law of gravity. Now, as far as I can determine, uh, Einstein sat in his office and put numbers together. I can't see anything else he did. Put a lot of numbers together. <laughs> Out of these numbers, he came up with two very special ideas. The first one was in 1905, called, uh, which he called the theory of special relativity. And that's where we get E equals MC squared from. <coughs> and many of you are familiar with that. But gravity was not included in this formulation. And it took him 10 more years until 1915 when he was able to describe and explain uh, his understanding of gravity. And it was different from Isaac Newton's. Isaac Newton um, said gravity is a force that depends on mass. And Albert Einstein said that gravity is a distortion of space and time. In fact, 
this is his theory of general relativity from 1950. And basically what it says is that uh, gravity essentially is the effect um, that masses have by distorting their s the space-time that is around them. Perhaps this next slide helps us to notice this a little bit better. You can see that that grid is just supposed to be a picture, an idea of, of um, the space. If, uh, leave the time out of it. Maybe it'll be a little easier to understand. It's space. And so you have different planets that are different sizes in this space when you look out in space. And the bigger, you can kind of figure it, the bigger the space, the mass is, the bigger the planet is, uh, the more it distorts the space around it. Th that makes sense, right? Okay. Um, uh, you can kind of see this if you have a trampoline in your backyard and you can try putting different size balls on it, like a basketball and a baseball and a ping pong ball. And obviously the basketball is going to distort it more than the ping pong ball. And that's basically what Isaac Newton is saying, uh, that it's going to distort it. So he explained all this. He did his calculations, his math, and he came up with this idea. And Okay, well and good. Uh, but is this really the way it happens? Is this really true, what he's saying? So in 1919, a gentleman named Arthur Eddington, who was the chief assistant at the uh, Greenwich Observatory, or I should say the observatory in Greenwich, England, um, there was going to be a total eclipse of the sun in May 29, 1919. And, and Eddington decided this is the perfect situation to see if what Isaac Newton is saying is correct because the sun is going to be completely blocked out and I'll be able to see the stars that are very near to it. Now, uh, I'm sure all of us understand that for the last thousands of years, people have been looking at the stars and the stars have been mapped. Uh, the Egyptians, the Babylonians knew the positions of certain stars. They had constellations. You recognize the stars. You know the Big Dipper, right? Many of you do. You know the North Star, how to cal figure out where the North Star is. You know Orion. Okay, so they, they, they people have known the stars, and they know where they are supposed to be at different times of year, pretty, pretty closely. That's how sailors navigated on the oceans uh, before they had compasses and, and other uh, instruments. So uh, during this eclipse, uh, Eddington got the idea, and he said, okay, I know that this star is, I, I, if, if I'm looking at the sun, which is you don't want to do, but if I'm looking at the sun, this star is going to be over here, and this star is going to be over here. But I can't see the light of that star in the day because the sunlight just blurs it out. But with the eclipse, it's going to block out the sunlight, and I'll be able to see those stars. Now, if, if Newton is correct, if he's, not, not Newton, excuse me, if Einstein is correct, <laughs> then the light from the star, the, the beam, the, the sight line going to that star, that light, when it gets near the sun, it's going to run to that distortion, which is going to curve the path of that light. Can you see that? Okay, it's going to curve the path of that light so that w the, the star that I'm looking at is really not where it is. It's actually a little bit off. Okay, I know its position, but it'll be just a little bit off of that because the sun is going to curve that light because of the distortion it causes in space-time. Okay, so this, this next picture is an actual picture that he took during that time. And you may not be able to see from back there, but there's, you can see stars, okay? How many of you saw some stars during this last eclipse? Yeah, yeah, okay? So you can see stars there. And exactly what he said came was what happened. And here what you see that where it says uh, normal, that's where that star actually is, but he saw it where the red dot is, okay? Because that line of sight, that that light was taking, that path that light was taking, came close to the mass of the sun, came over, uh, followed the distortion of space-time, and curved 
and came from a slightly different direction. And he was able to measure that. He published his results, and Einstein got the Nobel Prize. So this, this is science. There's a lot of math involved in that. Um, here, Hubble is a telescope we have up in space, and it's, it's, it's doing this all the time because we have white dwarfs out in space. We have neutron stars that have tremendous masses and tremendous gravitational fields, and they bend the light from other objects that are further out that we may want to look at. Now, the Earth, the Earth also, the Earth has mass, and it warps space-time. And so we see this effect when we send satellites up into space, and you put an atomic clock in the satellite. Now, we have atomic clocks nowadays that lose one second every two billion years. They really exact. Um, but you, you have that satellite up in space, and you bring it down after a few years, and you look at that clock, and because the distortion of space-time is less, far above the Earth, then that time has actually sped up, and that clock will be a little faster than the same atomic clock here on this Earth. And you have to take that into calculation when you're trying to communicate with the satellite. Okay? I'll skip that slide. That's talking a little bit about the atomic clocks. Now, here, if you're, and, and here in your pocket, you, you have proof that what Einstein said is correct. Your GPS that's on your phone, okay? You send up a satellite, you put it up about 20,000 kilometers, and that clock, clock is gonna run fast by 45 microseconds a day, okay? That's because of general relativity. Uh, it's also, you got this phenomena, which we're not gonna talk about this evening, of time dilatation, which is from special relativity, and that's going to slow time down by 7 microseconds per day. And so that brings you to a net speed that your clock is going to speed up by 38 microseconds a day. Now, if you don't take that into, calc in, into your calculation, that your clock's going to be off by 38 microseconds a day, your GPS location would be false within two minutes. And over the course of the day, you would lose out on 11 kilometers, meaning you would never get to where you're going. So when they put that GPS and give you an app for you to find where you want to go and ask Siri, location, you know, wherever you want to go, that Einstein's idea of the warping of space-time has to be taken into effect. That's science. I, you know, science is amazing. Science is great. Um, what is science? Uh, here's a popular definition of science. It says it, it, it comes from the Latin scientia, which is, means knowledge, referring to a system of acquiring knowledge based on empiricism, experimentation, and methodological naturalism, and I don't want to spend time on a lot of these big words. I don't really like this definition, so I made my own definition. Um, an organized body of knowledge regarding the natural world, which is generated through a systematic methodology based on evidence. Okay? So you can take that and work with that. <laughs> All right? Science. Science. Um, they, I want to look at just this idea of systematic methodology. That means there's a method to science, okay? There's a, there's a way to do it, method. What is that? The scientific method, a real, real original with that name. Um, so the scientific method, and all, many of you have been exposed to this, uh, maybe seven parts to it. I'm sure you've seen pictures or, or tables that show five uh, steps to it or eight steps. First, you have the problem or the question that you want to look at. Then you do research on that problem, try to find out all the information you can about it. Then you form a hypothesis, you get an idea, you, how you're going to answer that question. Then you do an experiment to test your hypothesis, you observe the results of your experiment, you reach conclusions, and then you communicate those conclusions. That, in a nutshell, is the scientific method. Here's a nice example that just can spell it out a little better about you know, do mice grow larger if they're given vitamin C? So you do research. You research about mice and their diet and, and uh, vitamin C. 
and you form a hypothesis. Your idea is if you're, you have mice, you give them vitamin C, then they will grow larger. So you have two groups of mice, and one group gets vitamin C, the other group doesn't get vitamin C. And at the end of two weeks or two months, you weigh both mice, and they're both the same. Vitamin C didn't do anything. You disproved their hypothesis. You found something. You discovered something. This is important. And you present your results. So the science. I started thinking about all this, uh, oh, maybe about a month or so ago, because an expression dropped into my mind that I had never really thought about much before. And we're, we're going to come to that, okay? First, we want to see uh, one of Ellen White's statements, and I hope most of you can read that. This is found in Councils to Teachers, page 19. And this is really an amazing, fascinating statement. Look at this. It says, a knowledge of true science is power. And it is the purpose of God that the knowledge, this knowledge of science, true science, shall be taught in our schools as a preparation for the work that is to precede the closing scenes of this earth's history. So if we're getting ready for Jesus to come and we want to be of service, we need to know science. The truth is to be carried to the remotest bounds of earth through agents trained for the work. So th this is truly an amazing statement about science and the knowledge we need to have about science. But we're going to spend most of our time, or what little time we have left, on, on the following. But while the knowledge of science is power, the knowledge that Jesus came in person to impart is still greater power. The science of salvation is the most important science to be learned in the preparatory school of earth. The wisdom of Solomon is desirable, but the wisdom of Christ is far more desirable and more essential. We cannot reach Christ through a mere intellectual training, but through him we can reach the highest round of the ladder of intellectual greatness. While the pursuit of knowledge in art, in literature, and in trades should not be discouraged, the student should first secure an experimental knowledge of God and his will. So there's a science of salvation. Ellen White says there's a science of salvation. One, one more statement, or several more here. The opportunity of learning the science of salvation is placed within the reach of all. By abiding in Christ, by doing his will, by exercising simple faith in his word, even those unlearned in the wisdom of this world, of the world, may have this knowledge. To the humble, trusting soul, the Lord reveals that all true knowledge leads heavenward. So this is the science of salvation. So we should know true science, okay, talking about the, nat you know, the, the knowledge that we should have about the natural world. But even more important is to know the science of salvation but what is this science of salvation? What does it involve? So she has several statements that are very similar. Uh, she says, Christ crucified for us, for sin, Christ risen from the dead, Christ ascended on high. This was the science of salvation that they were to learn and teach. That's from Acts of the Apostles. So it's talking about the apostles after Jesus went back to heaven and the work that they were doing. The next one, Christ crucified for our sins, Christ risen from the dead, ascended on high, our living intercessor in the presence of God. This is the science of salvation, which we need to learn and teach the children we meet. And finally, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ ascended into the heavens, Christ coming again. Let the science of salvation be the burden of every sermon, the theme of every song. So the science of salvation, again, we need to know true science, but even more importantly, we need to know the science of salvation. So I want to spend just a few minutes here uh, as we close or uh, looking at, okay, so what is the science of salvation? Well, it's Christ. It's Christ uh, crucified, Christ risen, Christ ascended on high. But, I mean, we're going to be studying, I would suggest, this science for eternity. And so there's so much that we need to know and, 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 and we can continue learning 
about this science, which is Christ, essentially. Christ, Jesus, him crucified, him risen, him interceding, and him coming again. So I want to, I, every so often I, I sit down and different thoughts come to my mind. I like to try to write them down. I want to give you just a little idea of maybe a, a little presentation of the science of salvation. Uh, I tried to put down the gospel, the good news, on one page, on one sheet of paper, um, so that I can be ready when somebody comes to me and I can, you know, they don't have much time, I can tell them something real quick. So uh, the following, we are in a lost condition. That's the first step that we need to know. That's just at the very beginning. Um, in Romans 3.23, we're told that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Ezekiel 18, verses 4 and 20, we learn that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We are lost. There's no hope for us. Even that favorite verse that we have, for uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, that tells us that the default condition of humanity is perish. It's death. We have no hope in, of our, in and of ourselves. But Jesus came, and that's what we are to present. Jesus came. There are three things we can say about Jesus. Jesus saves us from the penalty, and I'm going to close this off because I don't have these down. Um, so, but... Listen to it and perhaps write them down and, and look them up. Okay, so Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin. In Matthew one twenty one, who can tell me what that says? Matthew one twenty one. Without looking it up. <laughs> you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay. Um, Romans 6.23, what does that say? But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin, from death. He saves us. Jesus also saves us from the power of sin. Okay? And I, you, know, you may know this one and, and say it with me if you do. It's Isaiah 53.5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. We are healed. He saves us from the power of sin. Okay? Uh, John 1.12, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, sons and daughters of God even to them that believe on his name. So Jesus saves us from the penalty of sin. And you've heard this before. Okay, but put it together in a way that you can tell it to somebody real quickly. Isn't that the science of salvation? Okay. So he saves us from the penalty of sin, saves us from the power of sin. And what's the last one? He saves us from the presence of sin. Okay, the presence of sin. And this one... Well, we do sing it in one of our scripture songs, don't we? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more sin. I especially like this one as a physician. No more death, no more sorrow, no crying. And, and this really fits nicely when I have patients who have pain and I can tell them, someday, no more pain. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's what Jesus says. So, and then the last thing is, so what do we do to get all this? Again, going back to John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoso believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you can talk about believing. You know, it's obviously more than just saying, well, I, I, believe, I believe in uh, the warping of space-time. It's more than just that. It's, you've you got to be all in on that belief. 
right? You got to be all in. So we believe. In Ephesians 2.8, what does Ephesians 2.8 say? For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Okay? Through faith. And then finally, in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Um, he's our Lord and Savior. He's our Savior, but he's also our Lord. Okay? And that's where we have to come. Jesus saves us from the, power, from the penalty of sin, saves us from the power of sin, saves us from the presence of sin. How do we get this? By believing. Okay? And accepting Jesus as our Savior from all these things. He saved us. But he also has to be our Lord. Our Lord. And if you talk to people, uh, and many of you have experienced this, but, you know, we're in a place that is, you're young. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how else to say it, okay? You all are young. Um, it's, sometimes it's nice to talk to some older folk and see how Jesus has been through their life. You know, I, and I, the reason I say this is because I know some young people who have left the Lord, and they haven't given them a chance. You know, you've you got to give more time because these are things you learn over a long period of time. You learn how sweet Jesus is. So, he needs to be Lord of our life. Is this something you want? Okay? Um, do you have a need or a desire for what God has to offer. Are you willing to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I think many of you have. But this is the question that when you present this to somebody, this is the science of salvation. You present this to somebody, you can say, is this something you want? Okay, do you have a desire for this? If you do, then pray this prayer with me. So, at this time, I'd like to have you bow your heads and I'll pray this prayer, and you can say it in your own minds. Jesus, I have sinned. I want to be saved from the penalty, power, and presence of sin. By faith, I accept what you have done to forgive and take away my sin, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. My prayer is that we will Learn the science of salvation so that it can truly be a blessing not only in our lives, but in the lives of those we come in contact with.